gang. Here's to nights that turn into mornings and friends that turn into family. Cheers! Hello, hello, and welcome to the Friendship IRL podcast. I'm your host, Alex Alexander. My friends, they would tell you, I like to ask the hard questions. You know who I am in the group. I'm the person that's saying, okay, I'm going to ask this question, but don't feel like you have to answer it. And now I can be that friend for you too. I keep this list of all the podcast ideas that I have. I'm pretty sure every podcaster does this. My list is pretty long and we've covered quite a few topics on there, but let me tell you, there are a lot more. And of course, I want to cover multiple angles, multiple perspectives on certain topics. So we got a lot of episodes. There are some on this list that are bolded and double underlined. They are really big topics that I think would be super impactful, episodes that I am dying to record. And we'll get there. We'll get there. But alcohol and friendship is definitely one of those double underlined topics. So when I saw that Hitha Palapu who is our guest today. I'll talk a little bit more about her in a minute. But I follow her on Instagram and she was posting about how she's been drinking less and the impact that it's had on her friendships. And she just casually mentioned, this is something I'd love to record a podcast on. Well, sure enough, somebody saw her post and tagged me in the comment section. And soon enough, Hitha and I were messaging back and forth. And I told her, I said, listen, this is super high on my list. If you want to record a podcast episode, let's do it. So often, friendships are held together by activities that involve alcohol, whether that is meeting up at parties or gatherings where alcohol is served. Maybe this person has social anxiety or is just overwhelmed by the gathering. And so they think that they'll be a little more fun or a little more loose. And alcohol is their norm. Or how often have you been asked to meet up for happy hour? You want to get together for bottomless mimosas? Hey man, do you just want to grab a drink real fast? Why don't we go for a run and then we'll just get beers before we head home? As you are probably now realizing as you're going through your Rolodex of recent activities, alcohol is quite often at the center of the activities we're doing with our friends. And what I've noticed is that when people start to shift away from alcohol, it can actually impact a lot of our friendships because the things that we used to do together, those activities that center around alcohol, are not something we want to spend our time doing anymore. Now, you've heard me talk about my roots of friendship framework. If you haven't, go back, listen to episode 12. So often, I think that people have built entire friendships, whether they're meaning to or not, where their shared experience roots are going to bars or getting together for happy hour or Sunday bottomless brunches or grabbing drinks after work. And people haven't built any other ways that they feel comfortable getting together. So then those are your only comfortable ways to spend time with your friends. And one of you doesn't want to drink anymore or wants to drink less or simply just wants to spend time together where your hangout doesn't center around alcohol, this is going to impact your friendship. Suddenly, you're going to need to find ways to spend time together that don't involve drinking. Now, there is this whole other concept that I've also talked about on the podcast before, which is friend group culture, kind of like the norms in your friend group that so often we think are set. And if we don't like them, we just need to leave them. But I can tell you from firsthand experience in my own friend groups that we've had some really big friend group culture shifts when it comes to alcohol. Alcohol isn't our norm anymore. And I think it wasn't entirely the norm in the beginning but it really is not the norm now. Nowadays, it is very common to do all sorts of activities, to suggest hangouts that don't even involve alcohol. 
And if we are getting together, alcohol isn't the main highlight. And if we're all just hanging out and we're offering somebody something to drink, non-alcoholic options are offered on an equal level to alcoholic options. So I have seen a firsthand shift that this is possible, but how do we go about doing it? I'm not saying that today's episode is going to give us the full how. There's going to need to be multiple episodes, but I think today's episode is a really great introductory conversation to alcohol and our friendships. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit about today's guest. Today, I'm joined by Hitha Palapu. Now, Hitha is a multi-hyphenate. She's an entrepreneur, an author, and a speaker. She's somebody, honestly, I really enjoyed following as she's built her personal brand. You see, she is the CEO of Rosh Hashanah Pharmaceuticals. She is also the author of two books. The first one is We're Speaking, The Life Lessons of Kamala Harris. And the second is How to Pack, Travel Smart for Any Trip. But what I really, really enjoy is on Hitha's Instagram and her newsletter, it's the same thing. I will share the newsletter sign up later in the podcast. What I really, really enjoy is Hitha's Five Smart Reads, which is a daily curated list of five interesting articles. I would really suggest going and signing up for her newsletter. I even made a link for it. AlexAlex.link slash five smart reads. All words, no numbers, five smart reads. With that, let's get into today's episode. Hi, Hitha. How are you? I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much for having me. This is a conversation we're having today that I have been wanting to have for a very long time because we're going to talk about how alcohol plays into our friendships, what it's like when you decide you're not going to drink anymore. And this is such an important conversation to have because culturally in the U.S., so much of our socialization revolves around alcohol, whether we realize it or not, it's everywhere. And I think until you don't drink or you cut back on drinking or you're making other choices, you don't realize how present it is in every social function. First of all, how recent have you decided not to drink? You know, I actually, I do still drink. I just cut back in a very very big way. I uh, used to be the person who was like, I need this glass of liquid courage before being at a networking event or at a party with a lot of new people. And, you know, I'm still very insecure sometimes and feel these feelings. And really, it just was me testing myself. Can I get through an event and just not drink and just see what happens? And Turns out I had a better time than if I did drink. And so now I think I, it's more conscious consumption. I don't, yeah. I don't want to call myself sober, even sober curious. I'm just trying to be conscious of how I feel in a specific situation. So I do have a rule with myself that if I'm at like a big kind of larger networking event or party, I'm not going to drink. I'm just mm-hmm. going to stick with like a club soda and really be present. When I'm out to dinner with like a small group of friends or like with one other person, and I really want that glass of wine that I know is going to pair beautifully with the food or a very specific cocktail, I let myself enjoy that. And then I switch over to a club soda with lime and bitters as that's sort of more interesting than water option that I enjoy even when I'm home and we don't drink at all at home, which I just think is very healthy. (laughs) It's made for a better home environment with me. I'm just way more present with my kids and a lot calmer. I'm present with my husband. I sleep a lot better. I'm annoyed at how good I feel because (sighs) like you said, for so long, alcohol consumption has not just been normalized, but glamorized. Yeah. When you think of the shows we watched and that Nancy Myers aesthetic of someone sipping a glass of wine while they were cooking dinner in this beautiful open kitchen. Those were some pretty formative memories of 
our media years spent and watching Sex in the City and them all drinking their Cosmopolitans, like it's been around us and really influenced us in ways we may not even realize. So actively pausing and noticing and choosing to take a step back is still very, very new for me. But I like the direction I'm going into. And I also like, I don't tend to do well when I am super rigid about rules for myself. Uh, me too. But if I leave some room for freedom, but I practice being conscious before I go into any kind of event. So I've never really talked about me and alcohol on this podcast, not for any other reason than I just haven't recorded an episode like this yet. But I'm similar to you. I've said a lot in my founder story and all my places that I grew up in a household full of substance abuse and I've never really clarified, but it's alcoholism. And so I think I've always just really like examined why I'm picking up alcohol. Even like in my young 20s, even in college, I always was the friend that like drank less than everybody else. And it's a real problem. I mean, we're not going to get into like necessarily our personal journey of examining. But I went through a phase probably in my late 20s where exactly what you're saying, like the amount of consciousness you have to bring in in a social gathering because people just hand you alcohol, buy you the drink, refill your wine glass and having to do what you're saying, that pause and be like, do I even want this? Like, Does this even sound good? And There's something so interesting about it that when you start to examine your own choices or the fact that you have a choice to start with and then the choices you're making, everyone else at that table gets a little uncomfortable because it's just automatic. Nobody's talking about the fact that you have a choice. And I found Mm -hmm. that then suddenly people are like, oh, we don't have to drink every time we get together. Huh. So. What has it been like for you navigating this and like doing that pause? Have you noticed that other people are pausing? That it's like even just creating more conscious conversation about how gatherings center around alcohol? My solid group of like mom friends in this city, we all kind of stumbled into doing dry January together. So I think that's a really nice start of the year where we know we're not drinking. And when we get together... It's at a place that has really good mocktails or we're doing something that isn't centered around food and Bev. I've also, when it comes to just that, normally the default is let's go grab drinks. Yeah. Mine has been, especially for my friends and the people I know who work remotely or have flexible schedules. I'm like, do you want to go for a walk in the park and grab a coffee? One, like on a Friday morning, which I find to be very easier to schedule and plan for. And that's been a wonderful way to kind of ease into the weekend that I very much enjoy. You know, I think it's about trying what works for you. So back before the pandemic, I used to have this looking back on it. Now I'm like, huh, that was a choice. This sort of standing Friday afternoon date where I would like wrap up my work in a local wine bar while enjoying a glass and having a little cheese plate and really relishing that ritual. And then a friend would come and we'd catch up over another glass of wine. And then I'd come home and I'd usually have a third glass of wine, like just cooking and eating dinner. And I'm like, that's a bit much because now it's maybe a glass of wine once a week that I'm so very much aware of how much I had been drinking. And I only can notice that when I stopped or cut back in a big way. And so I think, especially as we're getting, as I'm almost 40, a lot of my friends just don't drink. Either they just never have over the course of our friendship, or they've slowly cut down. And what I recognize, it really doesn't affect the friendship. Like if I was feeling weird about it, that was in my head, that wasn't in their head. And then I started exploring, why do I feel weird about it? And like, It would go back to, oh, I'm feeling insecure if someone doesn't drink when I'm drinking. And then say, well, why am I insecure? And it went to when they're not drinking, me thinking I wasn't enough, that I was just more fun to be around and I was just more charming. And I just, for whatever reason, was better after I had had a drink. And I think that was a really hard reality for me to face, to consider 
that I could be enough without yeah. what had been my crutch for my entire adult life. I mean, I'm just going to let that sink in for people that you are enough because I do think there's something to be said. You know, we go to college, alcohol culture is very intense when you're socializing in college for most people, not everyone. And it really becomes this idea that like you're more fun when you go out and drink. Like, are you? (laughs) Are you really? And then, you know, I think even more about it, like we have all these layers of people who are wishing they were closer with their friends or they felt more connected to their friends. And when you get in, like, sure, you might feel a little looser to like have some sort of deeper conversation once you've had alcohol. But then there's also this barrier later of like, well, they only told me that because they were drinking. Like really, we're just, you're right. We've like convinced ourselves that somehow we're a better version, but is it really giving us what we want? Because I don't think it is. I think you and I could both agree that it's just another version, but is it better? And I think you have to be ready to face that in order to change habits. And Lord knows I had asked myself this question for years, decades probably. And only at 39 was I really be able to set, take action, decisive action. So I just remember last Diwali season being so drained because there were just so many events and there was just so many drinks, but also noticing I wasn't drinking because it was being like offered to me unwillingly or without me asking. I was seeking it out. And then I had to stop and say, well, why? Why am I seeking it out? And it was, I was overwhelmed. And for whatever reason, I thought this would make me feel better only to leave me feeling like crap the next day, getting my kids off to school and getting through another work day and then getting ready to go do another event. And I was just, my liver was probably pickled by the end of all that. So going into the volley season this year, I'm just like, I'm good. Like I can handle the onslaught of events. But even then, going into the season with conscious choice to not drink, I'm even questioning which ones I go to and making sure I'm going to the ones I really want to go to. And I'm not going to the ones just because I feel obligated to because everybody else is going because I also love a good night's sleep. I really can only handle being out twice in a week And it's not even drinking or not. It's I'm just tired. (laughs) I need better sleep. And I just am excited to be present in the times that I am out and then be present with my loved ones at home when I'm not and enjoy the time wherever I am, but know what I also need to recharge and be restorative. And I I remember my 25-year-old self was like, still very much in her party girl phase, out multiple nights a week, lots of drinks, whatnot. I remember just thinking about my older friends. Everyone gets so lame when they're old. And I'm just like, yes, they do. And it's wonderful. There are two things I want to touch on here. The first one is when I mentioned this idea of kind of doubting whether your friend's really wanted to tell you something. You know, when I was saying like, yeah, they told me that, but they had been drinking. And so often I think that we maybe go out and drink thinking that it makes us loose and it makes us fun. But at the end of the day, what's the point of, I don't know, being loose or being fun? If you can say, well, yeah, my friend got down on the dance floor and you love seeing that happen. But there's this like layer to you really being like, yeah, my friend let loose and it was fun to see them be playful because you can say they were dancing, but they had been drinking. Or they shared with me about that really big thing that happened to them a few weeks ago, but they only shared because they were drinking. Somehow we think that this is making us better friends, but I think it's really just this barrier that is there between us. And I say that, like maybe the reason I'm reflecting on this is because when I used to go out and drink more, I definitely was the person who would say things. And it's not that I didn't want to tell my friends those things. 
I probably would have anyways, knowing me, I'm a pretty open book, but I would imagine that they would wake up the next morning and wonder if I had actually wanted to share those big updates with them. And I don't want that. I don't want them to wonder whether I wanted to let them in or not, or whether I just did it because I had been drinking. So that's the first one. The second one is at the end of this little segment, Hit this talking about, you know, deciding she doesn't want to go out as many nights, like drinking or not, just go home and get better sleep and switching happy hours for coffee walks. There is a guest that I'm hoping to have on this podcast. We've, we've been in talks, but I'm going to tell you about him and his work anyways. His name is Antonio Neves and he is the author of Stop Living on Autopilot. He's also the founder of a group called Man Mornings. It's a men's group in the LA area. And his tagline, I suppose, like what he told me, it made so much sense. It clicked. He said, you know, the friends you want are the friends that you get together with at 7 a.m., not the friends you're out with after 7 p.m. And that one just really hit me. So I'm going to leave you all with that. Oh, I mean, me and my friends are so quote unquote lame now, but in like the best ways. Now it's like, oh, do you want to just come? It's almost like we've circled back. You know, when you were in high school and you were just like hang out on the couch or I mean, we were back in the day where you'd like aim and you would message each other random crap you're watching on TV. And then, you know, you hit the party girl phase. And now it's like we've circled back and I'm back to that just like chiller version (laughs) where I feel honestly more connected to my friends Mm -hmm. because we're just like living life together. We're not going out and I don't know. Yeah. Like kind of trying to like block it out almost. Now we're just like in it all the time. And some of it's not that exciting, but that's okay because we're in it together. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this pause on alcohol, this questioning, this thought, you know, you're talking about like the permission to give yourself the permission that you are enough. Do you think that you've had any friends who now that you've done this are also doing it? If anything, I feel like I'm following in the footsteps Mm -hmm. of friends who have either already quit during our friendship or just never drank over the course of our friendship. And my husband has never been much of a drinker. Even then, you know, he'll have like half a glass of wine whenever we would go out to eat and never even finish it because he just doesn't care for it. And, you know, I started questioning myself, like, why am I drinking like the most of this bottle of wine if we got out to eat? Because it was just such a default for me. You go out, you grab a bottle of wine that I'm like, oh, damn, why am I drinking a near entire bottle of wine by myself? Because I felt like I had to when the person I'm with loves me more without the wine, let's be honest, than, but he loved me enough to let me enjoy this ritual that I'm just, I no longer need it. And so I think it's really important for anyone who is questioning their consumption habits to be around really supportive, mm-hmm. non-judgmental people. I think that is provides a safe space for you to navigate this sort of period of questioning and reevaluating your relationship with alcohol. I'm so lucky to have that. I'm so lucky that I didn't have any friendships disappear when I took a step back. Rather, the friendships I really care about just got stronger. So there's this thing I talk about all the time, which is kind of this idea of like friend group culture. And Mm -hmm. when something changes alcohol consumption, it sounds like you were kind of on the receiving end of it. Like other people have kind of led the way. And then you're like, yeah, I actually don't want to do this too. And it was, it was a little easier. And I've seen this in my friend groups where, you know, I drink very, very little, but I have other friends who drink nothing like at all ever. Mm -hmm. When some of them decided that they didn't want to drink anymore Within our friend group, we really had to vocalize how we're going to shift things. So for example, I remember distinctly, there was this one time we got together and somebody's like, oh, do you want a drink? And then another friend was like, okay, well, what is a drink? We need to broaden this horizon because what you mean 
is beer or wine. Mm -hmm. When in reality, what you should be offering is, do you want water? Do you want a LaCroix? Do you want beer? Do you want wine? Do you want a mocktail? And equalizing all of that so that there's not a default option and everybody gets those options no matter what it's like starting off with the non-alcoholic options but that didn't just happen that was like a thing that somebody pointed out and i think that because alcohol is just so commonplace in gatherings that it's really important for people to start to think about where it's become the default and like vocalizing how that shouldn't be that way. Like, how can we change that as friends? Mm -hmm. My friend Molly hosted this wonderful event when I was in Charleston last week. And something she did as a hostess that I just thought was so gracious is, what would you like to drink? I Mm -hmm. have water, I have Gia, I have seltzer, I have wine. And just like you said, she put the non-alcoholic options first. And she very much equalized it. And it made for a really, I mean, I didn't drink that night. I was very present. I was very intentional. I had the best time. And also, I hope Gia gets normalized a lot more. Because it's, I'm not a sweet person. Most mocktails, I just felt were so just full of all the juices. And I'm not a juice person in my normal life anyway, in my non-drinking life. So to have something that's bitter and complex and tasty. I mean, swear to God, if they have Gia at every restaurant, I'd probably stop drinking like completely. I found some really great substitutes too. And the thing is that like, even the people who haven't cut back on alcohol, haven't changed anything, like Mm -hmm. they're fine. Think of all the times that when you were drinking, you showed up someplace and you really didn't even want the glass of wine, but it was offered to you. So you just said yes. And how powerful it is to offer non-alcoholic options as an equal so that even Mm -hmm. if you have had one glass of wine, two glasses of wine, maybe you want water and you're never offered that. So then you end up drinking your third glass of wine that you never wanted. Like it just helps everyone if we really Mm -hmm. examine how commonplace and default alcohol is when we socialize and try and change that. I also think it's what you said earlier about it, having the conversation mm-hmm. in your friend group. I think it's so important. I think it's very important to not go into this alone or not voicing your shifting behavior. So I remember when all of us did dry January, we had had a very robust conversation over group text about each of our whys. And now in this group, most often than not, we'll enjoy a glass of wine at dinner. It never really goes more than that. And even now I'm kind of like, thinking back, I was like, I could have easily had that faux Negroni, that no Groni at dinner. I could have easily just asked for a sparkling water with a lime. Like I didn't necessarily need this. And if you're the person reevaluating your relationship, I really, really want you to be very gentle with yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. not judge yourself. Please do not judge yourself for the decisions you made even last night or a week ago when they were moderated. I think what you want to do is just observe and analyze a bit, but not to such a deep level that you spiral because there's no need for that. You're now just being more observant of how you feel and what you are consuming to help inform decisions you'll make next time. And it can be a very gradual journey. You get to decide where you stop in this spectrum too, what feels good to you. But with a case of a lot of the books and the memoirs of women talking about quitting alcohol, whatnot, that has its place and that has its purpose. But I also think what's less commonplace is that for most people, it was like an immediate stop, cold turkey, whatnot. What's not talked about nearly as much is sort of the gradual withdrawal from it and stepping away from it and the very rare drinkers. And so what I think is important is to remind people, you get to decide what this looks like for you. You get to decide what your journey looks like. 
And to have an ideal kind of in your mind, but being very flexible on how you get there, I think is the approach to take when you think about reevaluating your relationship with alcohol. When you were doing that gradual shift, because I would say it took me when I really decided that there were too many nights where I was going out and waking up the next morning, like frustrated with the amount of alcohol I consumed. I think it probably took me, I don't know, six to nine months to really get to a place where I would say now, I mean, that was probably five, six years ago. Now, maybe once a year, there is something where I drink two glasses of wine instead of one. And I'm like a little frustrated with what I drank. But that initial period, it was probably a year of going out and trying to figure out my own boundaries. Mm -hmm. When you were doing that, were there any like rules you had with yourself in social situations? Because I had some rules and I think those might be helpful for people. So I'm still in my first year, which is important to consider. I mean, it was last Diwali, which was a year ago that I was like, and I need a break. And then I went to Mexico for Christmas and I drank many margaritas. Then I took like a big break in January and going into February. Then it kind of inched back in in the spring, but never too much. Then with surgery, I didn't drink at all. And then once I could, I enjoyed myself. Definitely. The summer, I enjoyed my nightly glasses of wine, especially in August when we were in Canada and spending time with family and whatnot. And I think that was Canada was I was like, oh, this is not as good as I want to feel. And that's when we got back is when I read Outlive by Peter Mm Atia, which is just a really, it explains the science behind all that common sense health advice you get. But the section about alcohol and really what alcohol does to your body I was like, oh, okay, well, so this is a little terrifying to me. And again, he also just urged caution. He said, there's really never a reason to have more than two drinks a night, more than four drinks a week. Like really just ask yourself, what are you gaining when you consume more than that? And I thought that sometimes you just have to hear something differently in order for your brain to click and the timing has to be right for you. So that was that for me, where now I've really been consistently cut back for the past two months, month and a half, two months. It also sounds like you've done some like bigger breaks. I never did that. But I just kind of like slowly mm. whittled, maybe whittled, but just like, you know, would go out and try and make choices that would make future me proud and mm-hmm. fail sometimes. But I had some rules. So like one of my rules was that if somebody ordered a bottle, I honestly never partook. I would order my own glass of wine or never let anybody else fill my glass. Because then people are putting like half glasses in there and topping it off. And you just like kind of lose track of how much you've consumed. So that mm-hmm. was one. Another one early on was that when we would go out, when everybody would order drinks, I actually would not order. I would order water. And that forced that pause. It was like a hard rule of, I will never order on the first round. I'm sorry to any service staff listening to this. I I promise I had a little extra tip, but then they would come back and they would bring the drinks. And if I really wanted one, I would order then or order with my meal because then that gave me like a forced pause. Another one is that when I would order, let's say a glass of something, like if it was my second glass, I actually would sometimes ask the server to only bring me a half glass, even if I paid for the full one. Mm. Like if I really want it bad enough, I will pay the full price for the glass of wine, but I only want half of it. And a lot of them would be like, okay, well, if you want the other half, let me know. And I'd be like, okay, but more often than not, I didn't. So I had some ways to like try and figure out my boundaries and like have that pause as I worked through it. And then now down the line, I am much better about even just walking into the restaurant and having some sense of, I don't even want to drink tonight or I want like a low ABB, like a low proof one or one glass of wine with this dinner sounds really nice. Similarly, like if I go to a party, I'll have maybe one glass of wine sometimes. 
And I'm really good with that. Oh, one more rule is with my friends, I've developed what I call, we call it an Alex pour, which is basically like, I want roughly four sips of wine in that glass. (laughs) It's very tiny. And it's normally just because maybe they're drinking something really delicious. And I want like the flavor. I want to try it. But beyond that, if I really think about it, normally I don't really enjoy the glass of wine. So that's another one I've, I've implemented with friends that might help somebody who's trying to Mm -hmm. figure out how to navigate this. I do love the don't order the round. Don't order something with everybody else. My, instead of water, I usually ask for a club soda with lime and bitters just because it doesn't look something as boring as a water. And if I'm being really high maintenance, I ask for it in a wine glass. Mm. So it looks the same as a cocktail would. I mean, so much of it is just about like the feeling because at this point Mm -hmm. it is like a sense of comfort. It's a sense of routine. It's like, oh, we're out with everybody. And quite often it's not even about the alcohol. It's like about having the wine glass in your hand. That feels familiar enough that the rest doesn't really matter. Exactly. And I also have been the one now to kind of take the lead on a reservation simply so I can pick a place that I know has the kinds of mocktails I like, like someplace with like ritual zero proof tequila so I can have that margarita I love, but on my terms. Some other things we've done, because you know, I have a number of friends who don't drink, a number of friends who drink very little, is we all try and always have one or two, like a bagia, the Mm-hmm. fake Negroni, some sort of fun, like non-alcoholic option in our house at all times. We've also done girls nights where we'll buy like a sample pack of some sort of non-alcoholic and we'll actually like do a tasting to see if it's worth buying it to keep in our house. That's fun. It's like actually leaning in to the fact that we all want fun drinks, but they don't need to have alcohol in them. Hit that If you had any final words for anybody who's examining their relationship with alcohol when they're out socializing or trying maybe to talk to their friends about how they're considering this, do you have any final like words of advice? No one is going to judge you more than you're judging yourself. Mic drop at the end. (laughs) And I will say that comes with age. I now can say those words and believe them. That in a way, even three years ago, I don't know if I could. So with age comes a great deal amount of either wisdom or just not caring. And that is so freeing. So just know that no one's going to judge you more than you are judging yourself. And to get crystal clear on your why behind it. I know for me, something I've been journaling about lately I kind of have three things I feel like I'm manifesting at any given time. One is professional as it relates to my pharma career. One is professional as it relates to my personal brand and content. And then one is something personal and it's usually a health one. So my current health one is very specific. It's to get my A1C levels back into normal range, not that edging very close to the pre diabetic Mm -hmm. range. And so with that, I know I can be consistent about all my other health habits if I reduce how much I'm drinking and just be very mindful when I drink. And if I'm with the right people, I know that I moderation is very easy. When I'm in a social setting that does intimidate me, moderation is impossible. So I have my rules on when I don't drink at all. And I'm very clear on that. And I have my people that I can enjoy that glass of wine with or They don't care at all if I'm just ordering a Gia or a seltzer or just sticking with water. And I think knowing your why and having the rules that work for you, and we've shared ours, so I hope one of them do resonate, can just help you stay connected to that purpose and the value that's coming from this decision. I think that a lot of people, you said it comes with wisdom or age. If you're somebody that's listening to this, and you are the trendsetter, you're the the first one to do this in your group of friends, remember that it's very likely other people, once you do it, will consider their own relationships with alcohol. Whether they change anything or not, they'll probably think about it. And you might be the reason that there is some shift. So you might just be the first, Mm -hmm. not the only. Mm -hmm. 
in the immortal words of the vice president, you might be the first, but don't be the last. Mm -hmm. And so by setting the trend, you're likely going to have friends who are going to come to you and be a resource and just be supportive of them in those social moments. I think it would be much harder for me if I didn't have friends who had sort of paved this way or normalized it for me. I think I would have had a hard time if I were the first. And the joy is that like with your why, with knowing your why, hopefully sharing that with your friends gives them some sense of, I don't know, like the new version of you, the Mm -hmm. goals you have, like what you want. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we all want to support is people becoming the people they want to be. Even if that means all of us adjusting to something like our hangouts looking a little bit different because they don't center around alcohol anymore. That's really, I think the question people need to be asking themselves if they're struggling with friends or to support a friend. I am really grateful, Hitha, for coming on here and having this conversation, mainly because I think I could have started the topic of alcohol and friendship with somebody who their entire you know, business or platform focuses around alcohol or being sober or sober curious. But my favorite part of this conversation was just that like, this is real life. This is what her and I are actually doing with our friends. And I hope that it gave you some ideas of how you might shift the culture with your friends when it comes to alcohol. Couple things I want to remind you of. One, if you are the first, you probably will not be the last. Two, no matter what, it is helpful to find activities with your friends that do not center around alcohol, to be proactive because you never know when somebody is going to decide they want to drink less or not drink anymore or simply just not center their hangouts around alcohol. So be proactive. Try some new things, build some new roots, find some new ways that you are comfortable spending time together some new go-tos, it will only strengthen your friendship in the long run. Finally, I really, really want to, like I can't tell you enough how much I enjoy Hitha's five smart reads. Go sign up at alexalex.link slash five smart reads and be sure to go check out her books. They are both so wonderful. I have read them both. I can't suggest them enough. And with that, I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Friendship IRL. I am so honored to have these conversations with you, but don't let the chat die here. Send me a voice message. I created a special website just to chat with you. You can find it at alexalex.chat. You can also find me on Instagram. My handle at it's Alex Alexander or go ahead and leave a review wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. Now, if you want to take this conversation a step further, send this episode to a friend, tell them you found it interesting and use what we just talked about as a conversation starter the next time you and your friend hang out. No need for a teary goodbye. I'll be back with a new episode next week.